You guys are awesome. They start organizing themselves. They know exactly what to do. Perfect. Okay, Ivy, go that way just a little bit, babe. No, no, D. Stay, Ivy. These kids voted on the song they wanted to sing. They had several options, and they voted for a great old hymn of the faith, as I call it. Um, and they, as you can see, they are small but mighty, all right? So they're going to sing this song, but if you, if you grew up on hymns like I did, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and we always had praise songs, but then we always had our hymnal as well. And so um, we're going to do Victory in Jesus with a little tag of Because He Lives. And so we put the words up there so that you can sing along with them. So they're going to sing, but this isn't just a performance. This is worship. All right? So we're going to sing, and they're going to sing their little hearts out. And please feel free to sing along if you know. All right, babies, look up here. You ready? on a dark and dreary cloud-filled day that turned out to be the most glorious day because all our sins were washed away. 
It was when our Savior hung between earth and sky, bloody, beaten, crucified, to pay a debt that we could not pay. He died a death that we should have died. See, the hounds of hell were hissing loud, laughing, mocking, hurling lies. Legion's fury, Satan's last try to end our Savior's precious life. But to his chagrin, yes, to his surprise, a mystery from Satan did our God hide. See, this crafty creature, he did not know that the death of Jesus would be his demise because from death, Jesus would rise. Amen. While the Lamb of God was lifted high, lightning flashed, striking Satan's pride, piercing the darkness, exposing his lies. The trumpet, the thunder trumpet, God's heart cry. My beloved son laid down his own life to be crucified. To save the guilty, the innocent one must die. As God's wrath and mercy fell from on high, his anger was satisfied. When his chosen one said, it is finished, then bowed his head and died. Ground shaking, trembling, quaking, he descended to the world below. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. He took the keys and he crushed that snake. He led captivity captive. He set the believers free and won for us all victory right there on Calvary's tree. Then early morning that third day, <clears throat> when the angels rolled that stone away, there was nobody where our Savior laid. Because Jesus had risen from the dead, he'd risen just like he said. His glory shone in brilliant ways because death couldn't hold him in that grave. Now every day we get to celebrate because Jesus is alive. Our Jesus is alive. He ascended on high, now seated at the Father's side. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Sin and death has been conquered by the resurrection of Jesus, our King. Yes, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's risen just like he said. Jesus has risen from the dead. He is our God, the risen King. Amen. Let me recap a little bit what we, we talked about last week. Because I, I talked about five days leading up to the last three days right before Christ's resurrection. Uh, Matthew 28, 6 says, He is not here. He has risen as He said He would. Amen. And so I'm going to recap just a little bit because it's really important for us to know, you know, what happened that whole week, right, leading up to the resurrection. Why is that important for us to know and to understand every day that Jesus went through and what was on His heart and what the people were thinking, and what that means to us, and, and how we can explain to others exactly what the resurrection is, and was, and what it means to us. So let me recap this a little bit. So I went through a few days last Sunday. I went through, first of all, Palm Sunday, Luke 19.36. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. Now, Jesus was fully aware of all these things that were going on around him. And the people were laying down the, the palm leaves and they were starting to, to praise and singing hallelujah and they were just giving the God glory, singing hosanna. And it was amazing. And all of a sudden, it also kind of hit Christ and you started to understand it. The very people that were praising would soon turn on him. They'd be calling for his death. Imagine that emotion. And Jesus knew this. And the Pharisees even came up and said, you need to stop these people from praising you and giving you praise like this. And we said this last week, and we sing a song about it. Praise them all the day. Jesus says, I tell you, if these people don't praise, if this doesn't happen, the very stones of every rocks would cry out. Monday, Jesus in the temple, and he was angry because people had defiled the, the sanctity of God's house. Matthew 21, 12 through 16 says, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. 
The passion and the respect that Jesus had for his father's house. His anger was righteous. And we talked about that. We said Jesus at one moment had started overturning tables and the scriptures attest the fact that he, he grabbed like a two by four and he's knocking tables over and he's just showing the greed and the, and the people that were in there cheating others. That's not what his house was for. It's supposed to be a house of prayer, a house of gathering, a house of worship. We even talked about one time when Jesus was going to the temple, he saw the things that were going on and he went back out and he made a whip. And can we talked about, can you imagine being in the temple and having Jesus basically kind of say, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys just stay where you are. I'm coming back. And he goes out and he makes his whip. Right? And he comes back and he starts throwing the tables over again and chasing people out. I'd be scared. <laughs> but you have to understand his heart. His heart wasn't that we were to be afraid of him. We weren't supposed to join in with the fact that the people there were, were turning the house of prayer, the house of worship, into this den of thieves where people were cheating people. That's not what he wanted. That's not what we were supposed to do. Like Pastor Debbie said, when we gather, that's not what we're supposed to do in God's house. So we sing, we praise, we rejoice. Then on Tuesday, the priest, seeing what Jesus had done, they tried to trap him. Four different times, they questioned his authority, his allegiance to Rome. Remember, they, they had the coin, and, and whose, whose face is on this coin? And he says, well, you give to Caesars what's Caesars, but you give to God what's God's. Amen. They mocked his belief in the resurrection. And they even asked him, they tried to trap him by saying, you know, of all the commandments, what do you think the most important commandment is? As if, as, as if they were, he was going to make an answer, give an answer, that they could say, well, that's not the most important one. But Jesus, Matthew 22, 30 through 40 said, you must love your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. And we talked about, just to recap briefly, we talked about our, our goal as believers in Christ, as followers of Christ, our goal is not to be good people. That's not the goal. The goal is to please God. To live every day to please our Heavenly Father. Because if, if I love Him with all my heart, mind, soul, and even in Old Testament says strength, if I live with all my heart, mind, soul, strength, and I, and I just want to please Him and love Him, then I will do the things that please God and not my flesh or even others. And I'll love other people the way, the way God loves me. Because my goal is to live for God, to please Him, to love Him. Now, if I can do that, then I won't lie, cheat, steal, murder, Envy, jealous, unrighteous anger. I won't treat people unfairly. I won't hold offense and be unforgiving. Because that's not what God wants me to do. It's not what He wants us to do. It's not how He wants us to live. So the goal is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul. And to love others. Amen? I love that. Amen. So they try to trap Jesus using a, a misrepresentation of, of God's word. But Jesus was on it. Just like he did in the desert with Satan. Every time somebody tried to trap him or trick him or tempt him, he came back with what? The Word, the word of God. That's why it's so important that we read or we learn or we study, we listen to God's Word daily. Even if it's just a, a sentence, a phrase, something we can take in and meditate on. So when we see the false things of the world and the way that the world may try to trap us or lead us into some lifestyle that, that's not godly, We'll know the truth. We'll know the Word of God. Wednesday. Jesus was teaching and resting. And Judas bargains to betray Jesus. Luke states, every day he, Jesus was teaching the temple. Matthew 26, it says, Jesus was resting. Matthew 26, 14, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priest and asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you, to sell Jesus out? They gave him 30 pieces of silver. Somebody told me, I don't know if you guys are here, but somebody told me what the value of 30 pieces of silver is today. 
Was that Tommy? No. It's like, it's like 600 bucks. It's like, really? So who did, let me ask this question. Who did Judas really sell out? Himself. He was with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He saw the miracles. He fellowshiped with him. But he didn't know Jesus. Jesus didn't abide in him. He didn't abide in Jesus. He sold himself out. He sold out his own eternity. Holy Thursday, the last day with the disciples, and then I'll move on. Jesus washed your feet. He had the Last Supper. He prayed in the garden. Judas shows up and betrays him with the kiss. The one I kiss is the one that you need to arrest. The soldiers captured Jesus. They didn't. Jesus willingly allowed himself to be captured. Peter, being Peter, takes out the sword. And what does he do? Cuts the ear off one of the soldiers. And Jesus says, no, no, no. That's not, this, this isn't supposed to happen now. This isn't with the time. He heals the soldier, puts the ear back on. That would have been really cool to see. I would have loved to have seen an ear on the floor. <laughs> and just, Jesus going, nope. That's, that's not, and imagine what that soldier, do you think he might have, it, the Bible doesn't say this, but if, if it was me, I'm thinking, if I was that soldier, and I didn't have any faith in the Messiah, and my ear was on the floor, <laughs> and all of a sudden, then my ear's back, I'd be going, oh, yes, Lord. <laughs> but I love, I love what Jesus says. Peter tried to defend him with force, right? And I, I love Jesus looking at these soldiers and saying, um, don't think for a moment if I wanted to I could call my heavenly father and have a, a legion of angels coming down to defend me so okay let's go just so you know I love that power that meekness is this quiet strength right meekness isn't weakness it's a quiet strength and I, I, just to hear Jesus go, hey, don't think for a moment um, I couldn't call down a legion of angels. Ah, again, I'd be like, okay, no problems. <laughs> and then they took Jesus away. And we think our week was busy. That was just five days. Good Friday. The next day, Jesus facing many counsels, and he was arrested. False charges. Jesus is rejected by the very people that were worshiping just a few days before. The ones calling him Messiah, singing Hosanna. Imagine how he felt. The pain in his heart to be accepted and then rejected. I don't, go, I don't want to go into too much detail because I know there's kids here. But then they take Jesus and they whip him. They scourge him. You guys know what scourging is? They just, they take this whip with all these pieces of metal and bone and fragments and then they pull. He's beaten, mocked, spit on, cursed, made to carry the very cross that they're going to nail him to. And to mock him, they put a sign. This is king of the Jews. They place a crown of thorns and they force it down on his head and I was going to grab this. Hope this doesn't feed back, but. This isn't like little vines. What they do to Jesus is these thorns are more than an inch long. And they just force it down on his head. Thank you, Jesus. Imagine what he went through kind of bookmark this question. Why? Why did he allow this? He said to the Father, if it's your will, Lord, let, let this pass, but if it's not, your will be done. He said, don't think for a moment I couldn't call down a legion of angels. Why is he doing this? He takes the physical beating, the betrayal. Jesus still had a heart full of love. And then they crucify him. Nail him to the cross. Why? 
Luke 23, 39 to 43, they start describing these things that Jesus is going through. He's on the cross, and he, asks, he actually says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They have no idea what they've done. Luke 23, 39, 43, one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he's given the same punishment as a thief. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. John 19.30, Jesus says, it's finished. Again, why did he allow this? It was God in the flesh. He could have stopped everything. What was in Christ's heart that he would go through these things, allow this to happen to him? Luke 23 to 44, 46 says, Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he died. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, showing that there's nothing in between us and Father God anymore. That to get to the Father, all we have to do is go to the Son. Jesus said, you can't get to the Father unless you go through the Son. You didn't need a, a, a person's permission. You weren't held back from being in God's presence. Jesus was taken down from the cross, wrapped in linens, placed in a tomb. Now it's Saturday. Holy Saturday. Jesus' body placed in the tomb that belonged to a rich man, just as the prophecy said in the book of Isaiah. Luke 22, 55 says, The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. So not a lot is written about what happened on Holy Saturday, other than the women were preparing the spices, perfumes, and resting. Imagine what their emotions were going through that, seeing Jesus go through all that. His followers witnessing the torture. But remember, he's, he talked to that thief on the cross and he said, well, I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Some scholars believe that Jesus was in heaven preparing for the resurrection. Easter Sunday or Resurrection Day. Matthew 28, 6. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Okay, so the women were prepared the spices before the Sabbath. They arrived at the tomb where Jesus was placed, and the stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty. John 20, 1 through 11 says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Mary had run over to Peter and John and says, come see the tomb, it's empty. Then something happened. Jesus started appearing to people. Lots of people. Lots of witnesses. John 20 says, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Mary was outside the tomb crying and she wept and she stopped and she looked in. She saw two white robed angels, one sitting on the head and the other sitting at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replies, and I don't know where they put him. Thinking that maybe somebody stole the body. She turned to leave and saw somebody standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought, well, maybe he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will go, and I will get him. Mary, Jesus said. And then she knew. She turned to him and cried out, Rabbani. That's Hebrew for teacher. She knew it was Jesus. Imagine that. I, just, I keep trying to put myself in the place 
of like visually what they saw, what they experienced. Imagine her joy to realize, hey, Jesus isn't dead. He's alive. Matthew 28, 8 through 10. As they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. He appeared to two men on the road, like Rod mentioned, Emmaus. Jesus had a conversation with them, and they didn't even realize it was Jesus. I, I, I guess, right? So you think they would know it was Jesus? But they were telling Jesus that they didn't know it was him. You know, they were saying how disappointed they were that Jesus had died. They were just really disappointed Jesus died, you know. It was sad to see him. We thought he'd be around forever. You know, we, we believed he was the Messiah. That's kind of awkward. <laughs> and even ate together. Spent time together. And then the two recognized Jesus. When the two arrived back to town, they told that Jesus had appeared. And Jesus again appeared to Peter and Luke. The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then he started appearing all over the place. You know the story. He, he appeared to everybody except Thomas wasn't there. And then Thomas shows up. I don't believe it. I won't believe until I see the wounds in his hands and his feet. Then Jesus shows up. Says, here, look. Side where they pierced. Look. He appeared to the apostles. See, you can't make this up. With all the witnesses, all the people... Does anybody see that kind of a satire? Uh, the video is kind of making its rounds about the disciples kind of sitting around a campfire after Jesus had been crucified. You've seen it. And they're kind of saying as if there was no resurrection. The ridiculousness, the ridiculousness of it. Peter's saying, I've got this idea. We'll steal the body. And the disciples are, yeah, that's a great idea. And, and then we'll, we'll hide it. And then we'll pretend that Jesus rose from the dead. And all the disciples are cheering. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah, we'll be famous. And we'll trick everybody. We'll fool everybody. And one of the disciples says, yeah, we'll probably gain riches and wealth and fame and fortune, right? And Peter's like, no, no. We'll, we'll be tortured and persecuted. And we'll be chased and reviled and, and boiled and crucified. And all the disciples are going, yay, that sounds great. <laughs> John's going, wait, whoa, well, wait. That doesn't sound like there's anything in it for us. You have to understand. It is impossible that that would happen. Who would do that? Who would steal the body knowing it was the truth, but die for a lie? It doesn't happen. You can't make this stuff up. Jesus just kept appearing to people. To seven disciples on the shores of the Sea of Galilee in John 2. He appeared to the apostles on a mountain in Galilee in Matthew 26. Jesus was seen in Cephas by the twelve and then over 500 people. He appeared to his brother James in 1 Corinthians. He appeared to Paul in 1 Corinthians. Jesus appeared several more times to the apostles during the 40 days after his crucifixion. In Acts 1-3, he led them to the place where he would ascend up to heaven. Again. Why would Jesus choose to do all this? Why would Father God allow this to happen? All these events that led up to Jesus' death and resurrection, everything that happened each day, because He loves you. He wants you with Him forever. He doesn't want you part of this world, living in this world. Jesus' heart is full of love and sacrifice for you. And me, he loves us that much. Who would go through that without a moment of regret or changing his mind or go, whoa, whoa, hey, well, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. No regret, no anger, no moment of weakness, no moment of self-preservation because all Christ had in his heart and his mind at the time was you, me. The resurrection is everything. It's 
not unbelievable because that's what the love for us did. Too many people still don't believe it. They don't know it. They try to figure it out. But it's about love. Jesus went through all that, that whole week of his life. But what does that still mean to us? Can we explain this to people? Can we explain that depth of love to people? Can we explain everything, how we just balanced on that resurrection? Because if, if Jesus doesn't resurrect, if he doesn't come alive again, this means nothing. The resurrection is everything. Can we explain that? I'm going to show you a video in a moment. I showed it a couple years ago. I'm going to show it, show it again. But before I, I, I show this video, it's very short, I want to explain something to you. Um, we need to go out and love people and be able to explain this to people about Christ's love, the love of the Father. I'm in a store yesterday and um, I'm talking to someone, just checking stuff out, and uh, they said, hey, you look pretty busy. And I said, yeah, I'm kind of busy. I'm getting ready for Easter. And, um, you know, I have a church and I'm just getting ready. We had a good Friday service. And, and the person looks at me and says, what's Easter? And I said, well, um, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And this person says, what's the resurrection? Quote, what's, what's the resurrection? And I said, well, um, God, he sent his son to live and to die for us. But he rose again for us so that we would not spend eternity without him, separate from him, but that we would spend eternity with him. And he died for us. He died for you and me. And she says, um, isn't, isn't Easter about eggs? Isn't it eggs? And I said, well, no. I said, what kind of happens is it's kind of a symbol of birth, but I said, like Christmas, the world doesn't want to celebrate the Christian holidays, but yet they'll come up with things that kind of, they want to celebrate, but not the truth. They want to celebrate other things. So they come up with other ways to celebrate. But then I, I started telling her, uh, she goes, well, um, can I Google this? <laughs> and I said, um, I'm going to bring you back a book. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to bring her a book that explains you know, Jesus and offer of salvation. But if, if we're assuming that everybody knows about Christ, yet they don't. And if we don't tell them, who will? If we're not prepared to talk about the resurrection, about the gospel, the good news, we're going to miss it, but more importantly, they miss it. Amen? Amen? The resurrection is everything. Let me show you this short video. The reason that we believe Christianity is true is because the answer to four questions is yes. How about the first question, does truth exist? Obviously, you hear people say all the time, there is no truth, or you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. When somebody says there is no truth, you ought to ask that person a question. You ought to say, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. In other words, it's a self-defeating claim. Of course there's truth. If there was no truth, an atheist couldn't be right that there was no God. So there is truth. Question number two, does God exist? There are several arguments for the existence of God. Let me just give you one. Even atheists today are admitting that space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing. Well, think about this, friends. If space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. Now, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. Now, we don't know it's the Christian God at this point, but we know it's a theistic God, a being who's beyond the world, who created the world. The third question is, are miracles possible? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible. But the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and we have scientific evidence for it. What's that? 
I just mentioned it. The creation of the universe out of nothing. If Genesis 1-1 is true, every other verse in the Bible is at least possible. Because if there's a being that can create the universe out of nothing, can he do whatever he wants inside the universe? If he can create the whole show out of nothing? Of course. He can resurrect Jesus from the dead or walk on water or part the Red Sea. He can do any of that. So the final question, the fourth question, which gets us all the way to the Christian God is, is the New Testament reliable enough to show us that Jesus rose from the dead? The reason we believe in Christianity is because an event occurred, the resurrection. Now, I have to ask you this. Why would the Jewish writers of the New Testament, all were Jewish with the exception of Luke, why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? Why would they say that a man who claimed to be God rose from the dead if it didn't happen? They thought that would be blasphemy for a man to claim to be God. And why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? They already thought they were God's chosen people. They had no motive to invent a resurrected Jesus. And certainly they could not have invented it in Jerusalem where an empty tomb existed. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. There would be no New Testament if it wasn't for the resurrection. Now, even if the New Testament never existed, Christianity would still be true. Why? Because Christianity is based on an event. The resurrection. Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line in the New Testament was ever written? Why? Because an event occurred. The resurrection. You have to have more faith to believe it didn't occur than it did. And if God exists, and He does, and can create the universe out of nothing, then He can certainly resurrect Jesus from the dead. That's why we believe in Christianity. Amen. So can we explain that, right? Can we tell people who may have never heard the gospel, the truth? But that's it. The birth, life, and death, resurrection of Jesus, that showed God's love for us. Jesus went through all of that because He loves us. He wants us to be with Him forever. He wants to reconnect us from that broken relationship with God. That can only happen through Christ. It's the best true story ever. Amen? And like I've said a hundred times before, there's no plan we can come up with for our lives that's better than the plan that God has for us. I know. I tried. It doesn't work. Here's my advice for the rest of the week, and then we're going to pray. We're going to close. Read the Gospel of Mark this week. Read the Gospel of Mark, what Jesus went through during the Holy Week. That Passion movie, I was talking to somebody, it's difficult to watch. I've watched it once. I think once is good. If you can watch it more, that's fine. But if you could watch a passion movie, if you haven't seen it, I'd watch it at least once. But read the Word of God, the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Again, we realize what Jesus went through, the challenges every single day of that week, and why He did it. Why? Because He loves you. Because He loves me. So give God some praise for His Word and for His love. Amen. Amen.